Grab a razor, grab a goo, and let's get fast. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. What's up guys, welcome back to the channel. Build breakdown, build breakdown. The whole bike, of course, is decked out in better bolts. All right, guys, welcome back to another build breakdown. I am here with Thomas with his Pivot Less. And Thomas, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your bike. My name's Thomas from Better Bolts, and uh, this is my Pivot Less SL. Um, I built this bike for a local race series that we have here in Orange County called Over the Hump, um, as well as some other 50 mile races that happen in our area, like the Good Dirt Ride, Quick and Dirty Filthy 50. Um, and possibly doing some other races on this bike. So this is kind of my first intro to XC race bikes and uh, the fine folks at Pivot hooked us up with these Pivot Less SLs to start the build. Sweet. What do you do here at Better Bulls? Um, I am a co-owner of the, of the business and I work on um, a lot of the advertising, marketing, website features, uh, kind of a little bit of everything. Rad. All right, so let's dive into the build. Uh, first, what's what's something like, what was your goal with building this bike? My goal with this bike was to have a really fast bike for that eight round race series. Now, Over the Hump is a eight mile course that you do uh, two laps on, so it ends up being like 14 to 16 miles. Um, it's around 15 to 1600 feet of climbing, and I really just wanted a fast, efficient bike, and I was thinking, you know what, hardtail would be a good way to do it, don't have to worry about with rear suspension. Uh, the hardtail is really simple. I wanted to build a really simple, fast race bike that um, kind of the geometry wouldn't change much over the years and it felt like I could use this bike year after year and be competitive. Rad, and I mean, I was with you during the whole race series. So this bike went through quite a bit of a transformation. Um, started with a 34 fork, uh, so knobby your tire. So run us through you know your decision making on why you changed stuff out um, why certain components ended up on the bike because uh, it's definitely a different bike from what was originally built yeah i think it's best to start with the fork there so i started with a fox 34 step cast and what i was kind of thinking with the 34 was okay it's decently light but it's still a 34. once i got into our local trails during training for the race i realized that this bike's capabilities are more limited by the geometry and the design of the bike and the things I was trying to ride and less on the fork being a major influence there. So while I started with that fork, um, it felt pretty good. I did the first couple races on it. I linked up with the guys at Fox and this fork had just been released. So we went ahead and put this on. Um, it dropped the bike from 120 mil of travel up front to 100. And I felt like that really suited the bike. This bike was designed for a 100 mil fork and I was thinking, you know, over forking it would make it a little bit more playful and a little bit better in the descents. But once I got the 100 mil fork on, the bike really felt uh, much more balanced, I would say. Um, also, it dropped like 400 grams, so pretty significant change there. It took me a little getting used to riding the, uh, I don't know what you would call this, like a reverse fork, where that, you know, the lower legs come around the back and the crown comes around the back instead of the front. Um, but once you're you're in a race and you have a number plate there, it really didn't matter. And now I'm used to it. Uh, it's it's no big deal. And I'm I'm really you know there are the remote lockouts. I already I already have XTR on here and a dropper. I had so many cables that I really didn't want to add another one. So I just opted for the um, I think they call it um, the three position remote, which is um, firm, open, and medium. The grip SL damper. Yeah, when you lock this thing out, it is like unbelievably yeah. rigid and even cutting the steer tube this is the hardest i've ever had to work to cut a steer tube um fox must have changed something up there with the material it's just such a stiff um material and difficult material to cut through i was pretty shocked right yeah it is a little bit weird looking at this thing you know when you when you're looking down the pipe uh up front when you don't see that fork out front of the tire it is a little unnerving sometimes when you're used to riding a, a you know a traditional fork for so long it's it's a cool design uh really interested to see um where this thing goes i think what's even weirder than the fork and took me more to get used to was this final tire decision that i landed on um man it feels like you're on like a dirt jump tire uh, but i'll kind of jump into tires next so i started with um, recon, recon. Um, you know, I still wanted some traction. I was still after a bike that I could go ride Aliso and Laguna on and, you know, maybe some San Clemente trails. So I went with something a little bit more beefy when you look at, you know, uh, an XC tire. And after a little bit, um, I noticed some rolling resistance um, with 
those tires. And so I went from a recon to a, a recon race in the rear. And that improved rolling resistance a lot. But what I noticed was my two tires were breaking free at different times. So I was more of like drifting the rear end instead of the whole, fr the whole bike moving. And I really didn't like that feeling. I liked my front and my rear breaking free at the same time if they were to break free and I were to lose traction. Uh, losing traction was something I really had to get used to when, when jumping onto these XC tires. Um, so keeping the front and back really balanced was important to me. So then I went um, recon race, recon race, uh, front and rear. And that was kind of the tire I thought I'd you know, end up with until uh, we were at Sea Otter and I noticed some of our Better Bolts team members um, were running this Aspen ST tire that was team spec only and it kind of got my, my gears going on. Wow, is there something even faster rolling? So when the T, uh, 170 TPI tire came out to the public, I went ahead and ordered two of those and that's where I've been ever since. Um, I never had really a sketchy moment at Over the Hump because it's such a mellow course, but um, the, these tires, the traction's pretty darn good. I was able to drop my PSI a significant amount and it's kind of the tire I've been rolling with for these 50 mile races that I have coming up. Um, and then this tire really allowed me to drop my PSI a lot uh, just because I think it does morph to the trail in dry conditions. I started my XC journey at 25 PSI. After talking with some uh, people that knew more about XC than I did, I decided to drop down to 18 um, just to limit the amount of bump I was getting on the hardtail and um, kind of my back was hurting after, after a race and wasn't quite sure what that was. So dropping the PSI and allowing me to keep power on the ground and the tire not bobbing up and down so much, the 18 PSI really helped me there. And for reference, I weigh around 165, 170. So um, yeah, that allows me to, to get down to 18 PSI. I then jumped in and threw in inserts, which you would think inserts XC, you know, I kind of thought that was a little crazy, but once I learned that they were getting down from, I think a Kush core is around 130 to 150 grams, uh, these Vittoria inserts that I ended up with, they're called the airliners, they're only 50 grams. So you really don't lose much there. Threw those in, kept running 18, 18 PSI, noticed a little bit of crunching noise and thought, you know, maybe I'm damaging the insert a little bit. I'm gonna go up to 20 PSI. Um, and that's where I've landed at. The insert gives me the comfort. It gives me the, uh, not that bobbing feeling that I was getting running the high, higher PSIs. So it eliminates that. And the bike just feels a little bit more dead in the wheels, uh, which is really nice on the hardtail. So uh, inserts, this really fast rolling tire and 20 PSI, as well as um, I'm using SSB um, sealant. I've noticed that's been my favorite sealant, just really coats the tire well, works well with the insert. Um, that's been kind of my tire, air pressure and insert combo. Yeah, when I met Thomas, you know, he had a, a enduro, specialized enduro, so 170, 170 travel. You know, you're running as a guy and like an aggressor on the rear. So this is a big switch up. Uh, it's been really cool. We've all been kind of diving into these hardtails here. Um, and it's been really cool figuring out you know, what's working and being able to get really analytical and, and, you know, where does weight savings matter? Where does weight savings not matter? Does a big fork matter? Does a big fork not? It's been super cool uh, watching the progression of all the bikes around the shop, um, you know, go from, we all built these hardtails and made them pretty aggressive because it's the way, that's where we all came from riding. Um, so watching them turn more into XC race rigs at this point has been super cool, figuring out how to, how to make them efficient and fast. Yeah, and this has been my first bike with power. So I have a Garmin mount up here and I got a power meter from 4iii. Um, that has been really helpful in analyzing and putting some metrics behind these various uh, changes that I've been doing to the bike and seeing like, okay, I'm hitting 22 miles an hour in this one straightaway and I'm using less power than I was when I was going 19 in that straightaway the week prior. Um, if I didn't have the power meter, you know, we're working all day, Monday, Tuesday, we go, the race series is during a hot time of year. We're, you know, after a full work day, loading up the vehicle, setting up our booth, then going racing. It's really hard to just take like how I felt that race day and think of something being faster or slower because there were so many variables in that, um, in that race day prep and how much energy I had. So the power meter was really helpful for me to see like, okay, miles per hour, power, how I'm doing on certain segments. Um, so that was a really cool addition for making these 
uh, different analyses. All right, we just went over fork tires and power meter. So let's head up to the cockpit. What are we working with up here? Yeah, so I, when I first got the bike, I went and got a bike fit. It's the first time I'd ever done that. Um, and they set me up. He was more concerned over like where my seat was, my seat height, my crank length. And when he got to the cockpit, he was kind of like, go with what feels comfortable. Your body will get used to it. And I didn't fully know what he meant by that. But my first couple races, my lower back hurt, my calves hurt. There were just certain areas of the body that were fatiguing before maybe my quads or my, my lungs. And so I really started to dive into setup from there. Um, I started with a 40 mil stem, 750 width flat bar. Um, it was a 35 diameter bar. Um, and the bike felt comfortable, but I noticed I was like a sail in the race. And when certain guys would go past me, they'd just be lower down in their, either if they were in the drops on their gravel bike, or they were just their body positioning. They had a longer stem, they were more forward, and they were just kind of pulling, pulling away from me. And I was starting to think a little bit more about aerodynamics at that point, but my body couldn't physically crunch down for that much of a race. Like my abs weren't strong enough. My lower back wasn't strong enough. I just hadn't done enough training um, in that sense. So what I started to do is work on my core a little bit more, kept my bar and stem set up the same and started to notice that, okay, rounds three, rounds four, I'm able to like stay down in more of an arrow position and not be fatigued. Those pains went away. I was able to max myself out on heart rate more and you know my quads be my fatiguing factor instead of my calves or my lower back. Um, so towards the end of the racing, um, I went to a 31.8 carbon bar, 760 width, and a 70 mil stem with a 10 millimeter drop. And it really allowed me to get myself out of the wind, made the bike extremely fast. Um, and it, it was to the point where um, I could be using the same amount of power, but I was going around three and a half miles an hour faster in this position throughout the course. So uh, that was a huge, huge benefit. Rad. All right. Well, so still up at the cockpit then, uh, I guess that's a great way to transfer into brakes. Uh, what brakes are we using? I know there has been a bit, a small brake swap that went on. So uh, run us through that. Yeah. So I've been running four piston brakes on all my enduro bikes for years and um, kind of thought it would be overkill for this bike, but I didn't know why it would be overkill. So back into testing and, and having to figure that out for myself. Um, I started with a two piston um, XTR brake setup, but in the front, I had a four piston caliper sitting around. So I took these XTR uh, XC race um, brakes and I plumbed up a four piston XTR caliper. Now this felt pretty good when I had the trail bike tires, but it was way too much brake once I started to go into these faster rolling tires. And what I mean by that is the tire would brake free before I could modulate the brake. Um, so if I did any heavy braking, the whole tire would just lose traction. So simply put, the tire didn't have enough traction for that brake to be of any benefit. So I switched to two piston, two piston, uh, and just a really simple XTR setup. Um, I think it's probably a good time to jump into to drivetrain from that. Like I wanted this bike to be simple. I didn't want to have batteries. Um, I hadn't ridden transmission yet, so I didn't really know of the benefit that transmission would be in racing where you're shifting a little bit more and you know maybe a little bit harder on your gearing i kind of wish i would have gone transmission but this bike is still just this simple no batteries um jump right in and go ride bike which is what i wanted to start with i want to jump into the seat and the dropper specialized power saddle these go on all my bikes titanium rails uh, just reliable don't have to worry about anything with this seat fits super well with uh for me uh, I went into a specialized shop, sat on one of their measuring devices. I'm a 155, uh, really simple to just go bike to bike, makes every bike feel um, very similar. And then my go-to dropper post, the bike yoke. It's reliable. Uh, whenever you get air in it, you don't have to pull it out, service it, anything like that. You can just go like this, hit this little lever and get the air right out of the, out of the dropper post. So then it's nice and, and solid again. Um, I've never been comfortable with riding with my seat up. I've gotten more comfortable now that I've been doing racing and riding this bike a lot. But uh, even just 80 mil of travel here has been really beneficial um, for certain parts on the race course or when I'm out you know, riding and I wanna go down something a little bit steeper, um, this seat post allows me to go do that. 
another really cool feature of this seat post is once we got it fitted um, perfectly to my seat height, I was able to pull it out and cut off a bunch of extra material, um, saving, you know, a few grams. And with this bike weighing in at 20 pounds, like every gram does matter. So being able to just chop off a little bit of extra material here and there was really cool. Yeah, so I want to touch on that really quick. Bike yoke is like my favorite cable run dropper post ever. Um, the only reason I, I do like the SRAM reverb is, you know, you get to ditch the cables. Um, but as far as a cable run dropper, Bike Yoke's fit and finish is amazing. It's super smooth. Um, there's like almost no uh, pressure in this. Uh, it's hard to explain, but this is very, very easy to push down, but it still has plenty of pressure to always come up no matter where it's at in the travel. Um, but what they did with this post to be able to cut the bottom is extremely cool. Um, they have basically uh, this sleeve here goes past the mechanism that actuates the dropper, um, allowing you to get the proper minimum insertion. And once you get this done, you can measure your minimum insertion out and cut the bottom of the post off. Um, in this case, we cut off almost, I think almost two inches uh, off the bottom of this post, which saves a ton of weight, but it's really rad to see because uh, it's super different from any dropper post on the market. So I started off with a set of um, i9 wheels that had Hydra hubs. I'm used to the Hydra hub, high engagement. Um, it was decently light at like 800 grams. It was on sale through i9. So I started out with that wheel set. I uh, did a couple rides on it and realized I need to go something a little bit lighter. It was kind of more of an enduro wheel set. And um, Zip had released this new high top S and SW wheel set. So I went ahead and ordered the, the S version. They're around 1400 grams. So I saved another 400 grams there of, you know, rotational weight. Um, and it just made, turned the bike into a rocket ship. With that, with the racing that I have been doing, acceleration is really important. Um, there's a lot of tight corners. There's a lot of groups where you need to get ahead before certain areas. And this wheel set really allowed me to accelerate um, a little bit faster. And for the wheel set being like 13, 1400 grams and having a 30 internal, um, that was really important to me because I wanted to run 2.4 width tires. Um, I didn't want to run something narrow and light and then have to um, compensate with my tire width. Brad, all righty. And Zip does also offer these with tire whiz if you wanted to option that as well, um, which is kind of a cool feature as well. That will send your tire pressure data directly to your Garmin, um, which I have found on like cross country and like gravel type rides, it's a little bit more useful because when you're having a good ride, you feel like you have traction, you just feel comfortable on the bike. It's super easy to look down at your Garmin and, and be like, oh, 21 PSI, that's where the bike's comfortable. Yeah, I think that would have been a cool feature for like these 50 mile races that I'm doing where sometimes I'm noticing in my training rides that I'm dropping a few PSI or maybe I'm thinking that throughout the ride. Uh, I never remember when I get home and I'm exhausted to check what my pressure was at. So it'd be cool in a 50 mile race to be like, okay, start at 25. Uh, the race starts at, at, you know, you know, maybe a little bit faster segments. Um, 25 might have a little bit of a benefit to it and then you'll be dropped down by the end of the race. Um, the tire was would be really cool to see that data of like what happens over 50 miles. Yeah, so these are actually stickers from our good friends over at Stickered. Um, I kind of gave him artistic freedom. Um, he knew that um, we wanted to do some like blues and oranges. He was matching Better Bolts colors for us. So he brought in this cool like burnt orange look that really matches um, our Better Bolts top caps. This bike did have um, an orange fork and orange top caps in the past. So that's why we started with that. So the gold fork is kind of its own thing um, outside of the decals. So it still looks really good with the rest of the bike. Um, and then our friends over at Ride Wrap took the bike from us at Sea Otter and wrapped it overnight for us, which was really cool. Um, it was over the stickers, so it's not, you know, the most perfect job. I probably would have done it the other way, but we had already put stickers on it. We didn't have a second set. It has, even with a couple little air bubbles in it, like this thing has stayed on perfect. I don't even want to take it off. They've offered to send another kit. It's so well done and all the edges are down perfectly that it feels like a waste with how much this bike gets ridden. Um, the other reason why I really like having a ride wrap on this XC bike with um, a carbon frame is that these tires, if it does get wet, they do pick up a fair bit of mud. 
And what I was nervous about is I would pick up mud and I would scratch the frame really bad. And so now it's there's a nice peace of mind where if I do pick up mud and it is rubbing the frame, I have ride wrap there as a protective barrier and I'm not thinking about that the whole ride. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point that you brought up with the mud. Typically you would think that a, a super knobby tire would be worse with mud uh, picking it up because it gets stuck in the knobs. But really, since this is a slick, it just coats the entire tire. This whole tire will just become like a, a mud donut basically. And it really starts stuffing mud and dirt everywhere into the frame. Totally. Um, I also, uh, with the whole bike having every single bolt um, as our copper color from Better Bolts. Um, I wanted to get some titanium cages as well. Um, you might you might think titanium cages are a little bit of overkill, but the weight and the ability for them to hold a bottle without scratching the bottle is a definite plus. Like we all like the bottles that we get. They're, we, you know, we rock either our in-house ones or brands that we like to support. Uh, we have some custom bottles and not scratching them has been really cool. All my bottles look brand new. Uh, so that's a huge benefit to the Silka titanium bottle cages. And then we threw copper better bolts to kind of offset that bead blasted satin from Agave Finish Works. So they, uh, on their website, they have King Cage, which is another titanium cage brand. Those are great cages. And then they have Silka cages and they do custom coloring. So Agave Finish Works, we'll put the website link in the YouTube video as well. Uh, but they bead blast these and they just have a really cool uniform finish. Brad, well, it seems like we're pretty much all uh, up to date on the current edition of this bike. So I think all we have left to do is go ride it. Cool.